the Holocaust sent a shockwave through Christian circles, from which we've not yet recovered, and raised quite profound questions for the church, which are largely ignored or still being debated. Initially, it produced a, a deep sense of guilt. Two parts to this guilt. One, that we had spoken when we should have been silent, and two, that we were silent when we should have spoken. One was our sin in the past as Christians, when we spoke when we should have been silent. And more recently, in recent events, the church was silent when it should have spoken. But many other questions have been raised. The nature of God. What is God really like? I believe that's the most important question for today. And I'm speaking a great deal about it and will towards the end tonight. The nature of man. What we believe about human nature is crucial to all this. The future of the Jewish people. On Tuesday, I'll be speaking in Cambridge on the future of Jerusalem. What can we expect to see in the future in the holy city? For the first issue was the past record of the church, an appalling record of anti-Semitism. As I said in the first talk, Jews have suffered far more from Christians than from anybody else, tragically. There are two museums in Israel every Christian ought to visit. One is the Yad Vashem, the memorial to the Holocaust in Jerusalem on Mount Herzl, where Theodor Herzl is buried. But the other is in Tel Aviv. It's in the campus of the university in Tel Aviv, and it's the Museum of the Diaspora. What has happened to the Jews over the last 2,000 years? It's brilliantly presented. As you go into the entrance, Jewish faces are projected onto the floor. And you have to enter the museum by walking on those faces. And from then on, you are involved totally. But it's the history of what the church has done to the Jewish people. And it really is appalling. But you ought to see it. I wish it was in Jerusalem and then tourists would go and see it. But very few go. How many of you have been to the Diaspora Museum? One, two, about half a dozen of you, that's all. How many of you have been to Israel? <coughs> well, clearly you didn't go to all the right places. <laughs> there is, of course, a long history of mutual antagonism between Jews and Christians. And we have to put the record straight, it was the Jews who started it. Originally, our faith was a Jewish sect. All the early believers in Jesus as Messiah were Jews. Priests even, many priests. And so there was simply a group of Jews who believed that Messiah had come, as over against many Jews who believed he hadn't. But they were Jewish. The twelve apostles were Jewish. Your Bible was written by 40 people, only one of them a Gentile doctor. The rest were all Jewish. And so our roots are Jewish. They're in the Jewish olive tree. But we tend to forget that. Well, some accused others of killing Jesus. Peter three times publicly in Jerusalem accused other Jews. He was a Jew accusing other Jews of killing Jesus. And many of them accepted his accusation and repented of it. But it was Jew against Jew. When Gentiles began to be included in the faith in Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, then that created a crisis. And the early church's greatest crisis was the whole question of should Gentiles become Jewish in order to believe in a Jewish Messiah. The question of circumcision was the biggest issue in the early church. A whole council was held in Jerusalem to settle the question and it was settled. And Gentiles were allowed to become followers of a Jewish Messiah without becoming Jewish and therefore without becoming obligated to keep the Jewish law, the Mosaic law in the Torah, which we don't keep. I'm not keeping it at this moment because the Torah says you must not wear clothes of mixed material. I think all my suits are 
from charity shops, incidentally, <laughs> are, are mixed material. Pardon? Why well, I'm on camera. Well, it, this was a charity shop suit. <laughs> um, I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> but there we are. It is breaking the Torah. There are many other laws I break, and it doesn't worry me. I'm a Gentile follower of a Jewish Messiah, and Paul particularly fought the battle for my freedom in that respect. I'm under the law of the Messiah. I'm under the law of Christ, but I'm not under the law of Moses. I'm not under the law of tithing. I'm not under the law of the Sabbath, though many Christians have got that wrong too. I'm free under the law of Christ, which the New Testament calls the law of liberty. But of course, when Paul won that battle, it infuriated the Jewish people, even Jewish believers, who followed him around in his mission and stirred up trouble for him after he had preached freedom in Christ. The letter to the Galatians is one of the uh, letters that highlights that tension. And it got worse and worse. Inevitably, there was going to be a split between Judaism and what became called Christianity. They became two separate religions and not just a Jewish group within the Jewish people who believed the Messiah had come. And at that stage, we need to understand that Judaism was officially accepted by Rome as a registered religion. Rome was polytheistic. They believed in many gods. They put up a temple to all the gods, Pantheon. And you can still see it today. It's now a Christian church, incidentally. But it was erected with many alcoves in it for all the different gods of the nations conquered by Rome, who were invited to join their gods with all the Roman gods. And this would keep the unity of the empire. The Jews, however, refused to accept any other god but theirs and refused to submit a statue of their god because they were forbidden to make graven images. And amazingly, the Romans accepted their religion but labeled them atheists because they believed in one God. But they became what is known as a religio licita. Now, the Christians never got that privilege. They were a religio illicita, an illegal outlaw religion. <laughs> and therefore could easily be subject to persecution. And if you read the story of Paul's life, you find that again and again, the Jews stirred up trouble for Paul and the Christians through the Romans by denouncing them. And uh, this was a major cause of Christian persecution in the early decades. So the tension between began with Jewish antagonism towards those who believed in Yeshua HaMashiach. For the first 300 years, the Christians couldn't pay them back. They couldn't take revenge. They wanted to, and alas, the one thing they could do, they did, which was to preach anti-Semitism. And I have at home pages of quotations from what are called the Church Fathers in the first 300 years, and their sermons slammed the Jewish people and said vitriolic things about them, made terrible accusations and stirred up <coughs> hatred among the Christians for the Jewish people. And out of that, the church gradually pulled up its Jewish roots. Later, they would alter the way they dated Easter and Pentecost, and instead of having Easter at Passover time, they worked a different way and worked it out by the sun rather than the moon, or vice versa, I forget which. And uh, they pulled up uh, Whit Sunday and separated that from the Jewish Pentecost feast. And they separated Christmas by months from the Feast of Tabernacles when Jesus was born. And through the ages, the church has almost forgotten that it began as a group of Jewish people believing in a Jewish Messiah. And today it comes as a shock to a Christian congregation to be told that Jesus is a Jew and always will be and that your Bible is a Jewish book through and through, New Testament as well as the Old, and always will be. But uh, 
That's what happened. And during those 300 years, there was one famous preacher called Saint Chrysostom, who was such a, a wonderful preacher, they called him the preacher of the golden mouth. And crowds flocked to him. But when he preached about the Jews, it is appalling that a Christian preacher could stir up such ill feeling. But that was the only thing they could do against the Jews, reporting them when they wanted to, to the Roman authorities as an outlawed illegal religion. But then Constantine went and got converted. I'm afraid I'm one of those who feels that's the worst thing that ever happened to the Christian church. It became, Christianity became the state religion. And now the Christians had power. They had political power. And so now they could get their own back on the Jewish people and they did not hesitate to do so. Legislation began to be made of an anti-Semitic nature. Christians were forbidden to marry Jews and vice versa. Then a law came out that no new synagogues were to be built. And gradually it progressed. And it was the church that finally decided to wall Jews up in a small area in their towns. The first town and city in which that happened was Venice, and there was a disused foundry lying empty, quite a large building, and all the Jews in Venice were rounded up and shut into this foundry to live inside the wall. The name of the foundry was, in Italian, ghetto. And that's where the word came from. That was the first ghetto wasn't long before Jews were made to wear a yellow badge on their sleeve. It wasn't Hitler who invented that. It was Christians. And rushing through the centuries, we had the uh, Crusades, ostensibly a call from the Pope to go and liberate the places of pilgrimage in the Holy Land from the infidel Muslim. And the Christians who responded to that having been fed this anti-Semitic propaganda for centuries, slaughtered the Jews as well as the Muslims. They began in Cologne, that was the first city where they slaughtered the Jewish community. And everywhere they went, Istanbul, as it is now, Constantinople, they did the same thing then. And when they got to Jerusalem, they shed the blood of the Jews as readily as that of the Muslim. And they did it all in the sign of the cross. To this day, Jews shudder at a cross. Actually, the early church never used the symbol of a cross, and I don't encourage it, but uh, we do. And the Crusades made that symbol of cruelty and oppression. A friend of mine, Chris Hill, whom some of you may know, was with his family on the beach at Netanya in Israel. And he built for his children a sandcastle. And a Jewish man ran across the beach and kicked it to pieces. And he said, why did you do that? He said, why did you build a crusader castle? And Chris had realized that he made the windows, the slit windows in the shape of a cross, like the old castles. Jews have long memories. And the sign of the cross is hated because of what we did under it. Then came the Inquisition. <clears throat> when Jews were tortured and given the choice, you either become baptized Christians or we torture you to death. The choice is yours. By that time, St. Augustine, another man who did immense damage to the church, had preached that it is legitimate to force people to become Christians because it saved their souls from hell. And he did it on the basis of one text, on the parable of the feast where the master said, go out and persuade them to come in to my feast. That word persuade doesn't mean force, but Augustine took it that way and that's what led to the Crusades and the Inquisition, the use of force by the church to make people accept Christianity. Now before you pat yourselves on the back and say, we wouldn't do that, wait to hear the rest of what I've got to say. So the antagonism grew. Now, all we've talked about so far was, of course, the Catholic Church. It was virtually the only church in the whole of Europe. Europe had become Christendom, a mixture of a political and spiritual kingdom 
the Pope having two keys, a silver and a gold key, one of which represented spiritual power and authority and the other secular power and authority. And he still wears those two keys as a symbol. And state and church had virtually become one in the Holy Roman Empire, of which Germany was the centre and the greater power. And so it's easy for Protestants to say, ah, oh, well, we're, we're not Catholic and we wouldn't do such things. We don't get mixed up in this state church uh, liaison which does such damage, though we have an established church in most countries in Europe in which the state and the church have got mixed up again. Nevertheless, when we come to the Protestants of Europe, I'm afraid we don't get the change we expect. Martin Luther, when he simplified the gospel and got rid of what Jews still regard as idolatry, all the images in the Catholic Church, when he got rid of prayers to saints and purgatory and all the rest of it, and got back to what he believed was the simple biblical gospel of justification by faith, he believed that the Jewish people would now recognize Christ as their Messiah and come flocking into the church. He really expected that, but they didn't. And he was so disappointed, even frustrated, that they wouldn't, that he turned right against the Jewish people. In 1548, no, 42, he wrote a booklet, a tract called Concerning Jews and Their Lies. And I have to tell you that the last sermon he ever preached before he died was totally anti-Semitic. In it, he proposed eight, sorry, seven me measures to rid the Jews of Germany, uh, to rid Germany of the Jews. Number one, burn their synagogues. Point number two, demolish their homes. Three, confiscate their prayer books and the Talmud. Four, execute their teaching rabbis. Five, prohibit travel and confiscate their passports. Six, forbid them to lend money to Gentiles. Seven, give them to hard labor, to drive rascally lazybones out of our system. And his final appeal of the sermon was, away with them, that we all may be free of this insufferable burden, the Jews. Now this is the Protestant reformer, and Hitler quoted Luther. Now the Jews did try to pay back, but now they didn't have the power, so now they could only preach against Christians. You see the change? In the first 300 years, Christians could only preach against the Jews, they couldn't do anything. But when they got the power and did things, the Jews lost the power and now they preached against Christians. And I have here a whole page of quotes from the Holy Talmud against Christians. They suspect Christians of sexual intercourse with animals. The Christians we shouldn't call men because they are not. Um, the Christian birth rate must be diminished. It is permitted to deceive Christians. Jews may lie and perjure to condemn a Christian. And so it goes on. Do not save Christians in danger of death. Baptized Jews are to be put to death. Kill renegades who turn to Christian rituals. Christians are to be destroyed as idolatry. It's all in the Talmud. So you can see this mutual antagonism lasted through the centuries on both sides. So what do we say about all this? When we turn from this appalling record to last century, the 20th century, we find the church silent when it should have been speaking, having for centuries spoken when it should have been silent. In the 30s and 40s, churches gave their support to Hitler. It was only in the 40s that the churches didn't give their support, they simply went silent. So Hitler either had the support earlier or the silence later of the Christian church, which was still 
quite strong and numerous in Germany between world wars. Hitler claimed, I am doing the work of the Catholic Church in getting rid of the Jewish people. The German Roman Catholic Cardinal in the 1930s wrote letters supporting Hitler in his anti-Semitism. He had been caught in a Bolshevik riot in Munich as a young man and a gun had been put to his head by the communist rioters and this had really scared him. From then on, the Cardinal gave his total support to the fascist party to remove Jewish communism. He became Hitler's Pope, as he's called in a book that was published last year. Those letters have now been found and he was Pope Pius XII. And this goes a long way to explaining his total silence about what was happening to the Jews of Germany during World War II until Italy surrendered and the Germans were in retreat and only then did Pope Pius hide Jews in the Vatican. But his support of fascism has now been revealed and it's a very good book. I saw it in, um, I won't name the bookshop, but I saw it in, in a bookshop recently, Hitler's Pope. If you're interested, read it. I wonder if you remember Kristallnacht? Kristallnacht was the night in November 1938 when after that conference at Evian Le Bain, I mentioned just a few weeks before, Hitler knew he could do what he liked with the Jews. And that night, Jewish shop windows were smashed everywhere in Germany. Kristallnacht, the broken glass was everywhere. And Jews were made to get on their knees and scrub the streets with soap and scrubbing brushes, synagogues were burned. It was a terrible night. And that night was Luther's birthday, quite deliberately chosen. For Hitler not only claimed to be doing the Catholic Church's work, but the Protestants' work as well. It's extraordinary. Thank God there were some individuals, Christians, who stood up for right. One was Martin Niemöller, whom I've mentioned, became Hitler's personal prisoner in Dachau, gave himself communion in solitary confinement by saving a little bit of coffee, ersatz coffee and a little bit of biscuit, and took that for communion every Sunday. Then there was Paul Schneider, one of my great heroes. Paul Schneider was a pastor in Dahlem, in Berlin. His widow, I think, is still alive and still there, but. Uh, or she was when I last went there. Uh, but he preached against fascism from the pulpit. His family begged him not to. They knew what would happen. The church begged him. They said, you're a wonderful pastor. We don't want to lose you. Stop preaching like this. The mayor and the council of the town came to him and said, please, you're a valuable citizen. We all look up to you. Don't go on saying this. But he did. And the night came when the Gestapo took him away in a truck and his family saw the last of him. And as they took him away in the truck, he was smiling. And I have the letters he wrote to his wife from the concentration camp where he was starved to death. And I found myself underlining, I usually read things with a pen, and I was underlining two words that kept coming, joy and thankfulness joy and thanks. And I couldn't help thinking of another Paul who wrote a letter to the Philippians from prison which was full of joy and thanks. Paul Schneider got his photograph at home. There were some and among Catholics there was Father Maximilian Kobe whom the Pope is about to canonize and make a saint. There were some but they were very few and they paid the price. For the most part, Christians gave support or simply silence. So this double guilt, and when the uh, Holocaust, the facts came out, Christians felt terribly guilty, realizing that the long Christian history of anti-Semitism had laid the foundation for the Holocaust, even though the ground of anti-Semitism had changed from a religious to a racial ground. Nevertheless, 
Hitler could build on the Christian record. This has had a profound effect on Christians in a number of unusual ways since World War II. And I want to go through them because they've created something of confusion in the Christian church. The first thing that happened was an eagerness to absolve the Jews of responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus, which was, of course, the basic ground for church anti-Semitism. And so churches, one after another, tumbled over each other to say that the Jews were not guilty. Notably, Pope John XXIII uh, produced for Vatican II, that important council, a long statement about Israel. John XXIII, the Pope everybody took to because of his humanity, had two prayers that he prayed every day. He prayed, Lord, a new Pentecost, a new Pentecost. He prayed that the Holy Spirit would come afresh to the Catholic Church and to all churches. And I found that very interesting. Secondly, he prayed for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel every day. Never knew that until years after his death. It was his private secretary who revealed that to the world. He heard him pray for those two things. His long statement was pretty well thrown out by Vatican II. They kept only a tiny part of it, but the part they kept was absolving, absolving the Jews from guilt over the death of Jesus. Presbyterian churches have done the same. Churches tumbled over each other too. I find this a bit patronizing actually. We cannot absolve each other's sins just like that. And there is an ambiguity in this. Christians of today are being called by, well, I won't say by whom, but by many, to repent of the sins of their fathers. I'm sure you're aware of this. Old books are coming out. There's a whole move calling Christians to repent, not of their own sins, but of the sins of Christians in the past in all kinds of ways. Now, we can't have it both ways, brethren. Either we are guilty of our forefathers' sins, in which case the Jews also are, or the Jews are not guilty of their forefathers' sins, in which case we are not. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? There's an ambiguity here, and I've spoken to those who are publicly calling Christians in this country to repent of their fathers' sins, and said, are you going to apply that to the Jews? And there is a silence on that one. We must really think carefully before we try and absolve each other of sins or repent of our father's sins. What are we actually saying and doing? We need to think very seriously about that. But you can understand how when the Holocaust became public, Christians felt terribly guilty. Not because they had necessarily been anti-Semitic, but because the church has been for centuries. Another uh, reaction of Christians is to see the Jews as totally innocent victims. And in the violent anti-anti-Semitism of today, I have been accused of anti-Semitism for daring to say that in any way the Jews were responsible for the Holocaust. It is regarded now as anti-Semitism, which the church has turned away from. There must be no criticism whatever of the Jews. Another is to say that it was not God who was responsible for the Holocaust, but the devil. That's a very common one, even among Christian Zionists, that uh, the Holocaust was entirely the work of the devil. Now, certainly he was in it. There was a demonic element there. And Hitler certainly laid himself open to demonic influence. I don't go into that. Um, so that Satan was rejoicing, because Satan has always rejoiced in the destruction of the Jews. He knows, as Jesus said, that salvation is of the Jews. Nobody will ever be saved except through the Jewish people. Jesus said that. It's the Jewish Bible, it's the Jewish apostles, it's the Jewish gospel that saves us. And so the devil destroyed the boys of uh, Egypt, when Moses was going to be born. 
He destroyed the boys of, Jer of Bethlehem when Jesus was born. I believe that he's destroying many potential Christian leaders in the Christian nations that have adopted abortion. But you can think that one through. So I'm sure the devil was in the Holocaust, but those who want to put the entire blame on the devil and, as it were, absolve God of taking part in it in any way, forget that the devil cannot do anything in this world without divine permission. He cannot touch you unless God allows him to tempt you. That's why you pray every day, lead us not into temptation. Because God can expose you to Satan. But Satan can't touch you. That's why God can promise the believer, I will never let you be tempted more than you can cope with. If he couldn't control the tempter, how could he make that promise? Job 1 makes it quite clear that before the devil can touch anyone, he has to go and get permission from God. Therefore, at the very least, if the Holocaust was the work of the devil, he got permission from God to do it. So that doesn't evade the issue. Another reaction is that a whole new chapter has opened up in Jewish-Christian relations. The invitation to that synagogue last December was from the Council of Christians and Jews, which has worked very hard since World War II to bring Jews and Christians together in harmony. And that is commendable up to a point. The whole uh, dialogue has opened up between the Jewish and Christian faith and leaders of both are talking to each other. A respect has grown for Judaism, no question about that in the Christian church. Unfortunately, it has been at the expense of evangelism. The whole new mood of dialogue between Judaism and Christianity says, let's not try and convert each other. Let's respect each other. We believe in the same God. The Jews can come to God their way and Christians their way, and we must accept each other. Of course, that fits in beautifully with the relativist age in which we live, in which everybody's right, in which truth is only what I think is true for me, not objective truth. It's what you think is true and what I think is true may be different, but it's true for you and it's true for me. Let's accept each other. It has killed evangelism of Jewish people. Now, if we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him, as he claimed, or if, as Peter claimed, there is no other name given among men through which there is salvation, then we are not doing the Jews a favor by denying that in dialogue. But it is now much more common for Christians to accept Jews in their own approach to God since the Holocaust. There is guilt attached. I remember going to meet the chief rabbi of Johannesburg in his study, very impressive book line study and a very impressive <laughs> rabbi with his beard. And we sat down and I sat in a comfortable armchair and he sat behind his desk. He said, now, Mr. Porson, have you come to dialogue with me or have you come to try and convert me? And he looked me straight in the eye. And when a Jew looks you straight in the eye, you cannot tell a lie. <laughs> and I said, I would give anything for you to share the faith I have. And I thought, he'll show me the door. He didn't. He said, now we can talk. He said, I can't stand these Christians who pretend to dialogue, but would like me to become a Christian. And we had a wonderful time together. We could respect each other, but not by denying what we believed. But that's been a post-war development. But then it's gone further, and many Christians are now saying, I was reading one only yesterday, a book about Christianity in England, and the final chapter says, we must now, as Christians, accept that all religions are valid ways to God. I say no more. But there was a conference in November <coughs> chaired by a Roman Catholic cardinal met to consider two resolutions. One, that Jews accept Jesus as the Christians 
Messiah. Two, that Christians accept that Jews are saved by their own covenant with God. That's where dialogue has come to. I do hope you're understanding me, but it's the Holocaust that has led to that. And it is frankly a denial of what Christians have believed and preached for 2,000 years. Another surprising development is that there has been a widespread sympathy throughout the Christian church, particularly in this country, for Jews and Judaism, but a profound hostility to Israel, the state. Now that seems a contradiction, doesn't it? You'd have thought that a growing sympathy for Judaism and Jews would lead to welcoming the state of Israel. No, no. On the contrary, by and large, the church in this country is anti-Israel. It may be pro-Judaism, but it's now anti-Israel as a political entity. Christians are, of course, deeply divided over Israel, very deeply divided. And I've no doubt this will come out at Cambridge next Tuesday when we consider the future of Jerusalem. At one end are what are called the dispensationalist believers. That phrase attaches to those particularly from brethren backgrounds, the teaching that goes back to J.N. Darby, uh, who himself influenced Dr. C.I. Schofield, who produced the Schofield Bible, which contained this teaching in the notes, and uh, Dallas Seminary uh, and its uh, pupils, ranging from Hal Lindsay to Arnold Fruchtenbaum and many others. And this view, of course, is that Jesus is coming for his church before the big trouble. The church will escape all the big trouble at the end and go to heaven, leaving the Jewish people to evangelize the world. It is a, an unusual view. It's recent. It dates from about 1830. But as part of that view, there is, of course, a very strong belief that the return of Jews to Israel itself um, is the primary sign for the Lord's return, which may be expected soon, and a number of other um, beliefs are tied in with it. That's at one extreme. At the opposite extreme are those who believe that there is no divine uh, significance no theological or spiritual significance in the rebirth of the state of Israel. It is simply a political accident of history. And therefore, to see God in it is uh, mistaken. Somewhere in between uh, are some other Christians, Christian Zionism, the embassy in Jerusalem, established, I was there for its establishment, uh, when... Uh, Jerusalem was declared the eternal capital of Israel by the Knesset and all the national embassies retreated from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv except the Christians who opened an embassy in Jerusalem to assure the Jewish people. I hope to go out there for their fourth congress on Christian Zionism week after next. They had as their call that the time has come to comfort Jerusalem and support Israel. They tend to be pro-Israel and have to struggle not to be anti-Arab or anti-Islam. So there's a whole range of attitudes to Israel as distinct from attitudes to Judaism, which is much more consistent and sympathetic. Why is the church in this country so widely anti-Israel and pro-Arab? And it is. As is the Foreign Office. Our government has often been pro-Israel, uh, from Harold Wilson to Margaret Thatcher. Harold Wilson has written a huge book, The Chariots of Israel, based on Isaiah 11. I've never met anybody who's ever read it. <laughs> but there were, there were two, two fixed ideas in uh, Harold Wilson's mind. One was Harold Wilson and the other was Israel. <laughs> and he never wavered from those two. <laughs> Changed course on a number of other issues, but he never wavered on those two. Neither did Margaret Thatcher. 
And some of you know how I told Margaret Thatcher she was going to be Prime Minister before she was, and uh, told her to contact Menachem Begin as soon as possible. And she quoted me in her first response to journalists outside number 10, and then uh, quoted the prayer of St. Francis. Do you remember that? Well, a little bit before that came from me, but uh, she was consistently pro-Israel. And it's not a coincidence that Harold Wilson and Margaret Thatcher had the longest premierships this last century of all our prime ministers. Whereas those who broke promises to Israel, six of them, in my lifetime went into the political wilderness shortly after. From Neville Chamberlain through Winston Churchill in 1945, right up to um, who was the Labour Prime Minister before Margaret Thatcher. Callaghan. Right up to Callaghan, James Callaghan. <coughs> So, uh, yes, you can read God's hand in history, British history as well as anybody else's. But why the church? There are two theologies that have profoundly influenced the Christian church in post-war periods. One is called liberation theology, largely originating in Latin America, where there is awful oppression of the poor, Liberation theology, putting it very naively and simply, says the gospel is a gospel of liberation of the oppressed and the poor. In other words, it's a theology of the underdog. And it is no surprise that it has latched on very much to the Palestinians in Israel because they are the underdog. They are second-class citizens. And whether it's refugees outside the land of Israel or second-class citizens inside being treated as if they were not part of the nation, uh, there is a legitimate protest. And liberation theology has stimulated and fed that protest. And I also have said that while I believe that God gave the ownership to the Jews of the land unconditionally, he didn't say the occupation of it was unconditional. And among the teaching of the Old Testament is some very strong words about the treatment of strangers within the land and aliens living in their midst. And I do not back Israel right or wrong. I believe those who truly love Israel distinguish between right and wrong for them and want to help them to see the difference. But liberation theology has focused on the present Palestinian protest as the underdog. I have to say that some of the most profoundly moving experiences I have had is with Palestinian Christians who believe that God has brought the Jews back to the Promised Land. I think of one who said to me, what are the Jews doing giving Jericho away? when that was the first city God gave them. When a Palestinian asks that, and you realize the cost of saying that, nevertheless, uh, this is the general mood that I encounter. There is more sympathy for Palestinians, <laughs> forgetting the facts. And one of the most remarkable books I've read, sorry, that's the wrong one, is by the White House advisor on Middle East affairs. Remarkable book called From Time Immemorial by Joan Peters. She started out with total sympathy for the Palestinians. And yet when she delved into the facts of history, there are loads of statistics in this huge book. She discovered what many have not realized, the huge immigration of Arabs into the Promised Land between the two world wars. Enormous influx of Arabs because at the beginning of the 20th century, Palestine was almost uninhabited. It was deserted. If you look at pictures by artists like Roberts in those days, you wonder where all the people are, where all the houses are. They weren't there. It was largely empty. But Arabs poured in, and at the same time as the British were keeping Jewish immigrants out, they were allowing that flood in and the facts and figures were all there. It completely changed the White House advisors thinking about the whole situation because there were Jewish refugees from all the Arab lands. But instead of being kept in 
camps as a political instrument, they were given homes in Israel. There's a whole lot of history that needs to be understood before we rush into sympathies either way. And I spent two months in the Middle East, staying alternatively in Arab and Jewish Israeli homes, gathering neighbors into the homes and preaching to them, and went from Elat right through to the borders of Lebanon, talking to both. And I have friends on both sides. But we need to get the whole truth. And unfortunately, I believe sincerely that the media are biased and that we're getting one side of the whole picture. I wonder if you've heard that Arab nations are giving huge sums of money to be given to anybody injured or the family of anybody killed on the Palestinian side in the present troubles. They have large financial incentives to expose themselves and their children to the troubles. But I haven't seen that reported in a single paper. $2,000 if you're injured in the troubles, coming from the other rich, oil-rich Arab neighbors. Well, there it is. Liberation theology has tended to put Christians in many books, bias to the poor. I could mention title after title which say that Christianity must be for the underdog. Now, let's say straight away that God is the, fa is the father to the fatherless and the husband to the widow, and God cares for all. But we can go a little too far in this bias to the underdog if all it does is make us blind to the facts. The other theology is much more dangerous and much more prevalent here as distinct from liberation theology, which was largely Latin America, but has influenced many preachers here. But the one that has influenced preachers here is replacement theology. That is the big problem here. And that is the teaching that the church has replaced Israel as the chosen people of God. That God has finished with them, and he has a new people called the church who dare to call themselves the new Israel. Have you heard that phrase? The name Israel is used over 70 times in the New Testament, not once of the Christian church. Every time, with one ambiguous exception, only one, of the Jewish people. Israel is still his people. And even if that were not the case, Romans 11, to, say, to look at no other chapter, Romans 11 makes it absolutely clear, the Jews may have rejected God, but God has not rejected them and never will. And when all the Gentiles are gathered in, all Israel, literally meaning Israel as a whole, will be saved. It's there in your New Testament. God doesn't break covenants. In fact, in Romans 11, it states this, after mentioning the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it says, the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. That does not mean that every Jew will be saved. Far from it. His covenant was not with the individual, but with the people. The people will be. There will always be a Jewish people. Well now, turning to something else. These two liberation theology and replacement theology have done an awful lot of damage to an objective and unbiased look at the Middle East. The simple fact is our faith is Jewish. The apostles are all Jewish. When you get to the New Jerusalem, you'll find 24 names inscribed on the gates and the foundations, and every one of them will be Jewish. And you'll look on a Jew called Jesus and see the Lamb of God. Our Bible is Jewish, our Savior and Lord are Jewish. We owe an incredible debt to the Jewish people. And one of my tapes has gone round the world. It's called, It's Time for Gentiles to Repay Their Debt to the Jews. And it was an address given in a tent in Finchley, which they call Tel Aviv on the local buses, uh, of a thousand people. We had a kosher supper, and I spoke 
that evening to Jews. That tape has gone round the world to churches and synagogues, even to Golda Meir. And uh, it's a message that I hope some of you will hear. How many of you have heard that tape? Uh, just a few. It's one of those tapes like this address on the Holocaust where I feel I've put a plug into a live socket and I feel there's a message here that's going to run. Though this is the last time I'm going to speak it, I know this video and tape are going to run and run. Well, now let's grasp the nettle firmly. Was the Holocaust punishment for crucifying Jesus? My answer is directly no, but indirectly yes. It was the culmination, indeed the consummation, of the second exile, which began in AD 70, significantly exactly 40 years after Jesus' death. Why do I say significantly? Because God always tests people with the figure 40. 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness for Jesus. This figure 40 is always associated with God testing, giving people an opportunity. And for 40 years after the crucifixion, the Jews had an opportunity, and many of them took it. But AD 70, the time was up, and the temple was destroyed yet again. They went into exile. Jesus predicted the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of the second temple and, most important, connected it with his coming, his first coming. He wept over the city of Jerusalem and said, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks and you wouldn't. You have missed the day of your visitation and your house is left desolate. And it was. And they've recently uncovered, archaeologists have uncovered, the fallen stones of the temple, the stones that Jesus said not one would be left standing on another. You can actually go and look at those stones. They've smashed through the paving stones of the street 40 or 50 feet below. We've stood and looked at them. Jesus connected the second exile with himself and the troubles that would follow. One of the things he said as he carried his cross, I've never heard preachers quote, if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? He was speaking as a carpenter, probably looking at the hammer and nails carried by the soldiers. Took him back to his carpentry days. You don't try to cut green wood. You wait till it's seasoned. And he says, as far as I'm concerned, they are cut, trying to cut down green wood. But when you are ripe for judgment, when the wood is dry, what will happen to you? Don't weep for me, daughters of Jerusalem, weep for yourselves. It's all there. Nor did the apostles hesitate to accuse the Jewish people of murdering Jesus. Peter, three times recorded in the book of Acts, is accusing the children of Jerusalem the crowd, of course, had accepted collective responsibility for it. They said at his crucifixion, his blood be upon us and our children. It's there. The second exile was much longer because the sin was greater. <coughs> the real question is how far do Jews of our day share in the attitude of those who crucified Jesus? That's the real question. Not are they responsible for what their fathers did, but how far do they share? That's the question for us about our father's sins. Not are we responsible for their sins, but how far do we share the attitude that led them into sin? You follow me? That's my approach to the whole question. But the church's persecution of Jewish people is utterly, utterly unchristian. The church has behaved as if it had a similar mandate to the Jews entering the Promised Land. They had a mandate under God to destroy the Canaanites. And that was God's judgment on a, a land that had become so filthy and degraded in his sight that they were ripe for judgment. And the more archaeologists have revealed of Canaanite lifestyle, the more you understand why God 
had to judge them and why he used the Jews to do it. But Christians were never given by Jesus a mandate to do sim similar things to Jewish people, never. And we Christians need to remember these facts. Fact number one, Gentiles crucified Jesus. Three times in Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus says, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of Gentiles and be crucified. Now, if the Jews were responsible for the cross of Jesus, then so are Gentiles. And we must accept the responsibility if we accuse Jews of killing Jesus, then go and accuse every Gentile of killing Jesus. It would be just as logical. Secondly, we need to remember that the Jews' rejection of Jesus meant our salvation as Gentiles. <coughs> Paul says that in Romans 11. The gospel came to you because they turned it down. You should thank, be thankful in the sense that they did. It made Gentiles the heirs of salvation. Thirdly, we need to remember that Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We don't know who he was praying for. The context suggests he was praying for the Roman soldiers who actually drove the nails in. Could be that he was widening that prayer. We don't know. But that was his spirit. Next, we need to remember our debt to the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. We wouldn't know salvation but for them. And finally, we need to remember every one of us, it was my sin and your sin that put him there. I am responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. He died for me. How dare I accuse anyone else? Do you follow me? It's only too easy to feel morally superior to those who actually did it, but we are not. Which brings me to the point that the Holocaust proves, confirms the biblical view of man, the biblical view of human nature. The Jews or the Nazis were no worse and no better than anyone in this room. The Nazis were not subhuman beings or beasts. I read that only today in the papers. They were brutal beasts. They weren't. They were human beings. And if we treat the Nazis as animals, we are falling into the Nazi trap, for they treated the Jews as rodents and bacillus. It's the Nazi error to treat human beings as less than human. And yet we so easily drop into it. I can remember the propaganda of World War II, the propaganda of the British government that taught me as a little boy to think, once we get rid of the Germans, all our problems are gone. They are the evil ones. And I remember it, uh, an effort to raise money for the war. I made a, a little wooden thing of Hitler with his face on a hinge like a coconut shine got money from people throwing things at Hitler as if he was an animal. I fell for it. It was a lie. But we wanted to believe it, that they were less than human. Actually, the Auschwitz guards went home from putting Jews in the gas ovens to love their wives and their children and their pets and to sing carols at Christmas. They were human beings. And if you think you are not capable of doing what they did, you don't understand yourself. You have fallen for the humanist lie. The humanist lie is that human nature is basically good, but capable of evil. The biblical view of man is that every man, woman, and child is basically evil, but capable of good. Jesus said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, that's the Bible view of man, and it says Jesus would not trust anybody because he knew what was in man. The Bible has a much more pessimistic view of human nature than humanists have. Alas, Anne Frank, my daughter played the part of Anne Frank in a play in Guildford. She looked like her, and we had a letter from Anne Frank's father to read when we presented the play. But you know, when you read Anne Frank's diary, the saddest comment is, Right at the end, 
just before she was betrayed and taken off to the camp, she says, all in all, I believe that human nature is essentially good. That's the optimism of humanism. It's not the Bible view of human nature. The Holocaust confirms that everybody is capable of utter barbarity and cruelty. Given sufficient pressure of pride and patriotism, we are all capable of doing similar things. And therefore, the worst Nazis were also capable of being redeemed. One of the most moving uh, experiences I often talk about is of Padre Gerica and the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg at the tr trials after the war. I've been to the jail where it all happened. And uh, you see, when the 21 Nazi war criminals were brought to trial for the murder of 30 million people, they were each offered a free lawyer to defend them and a free chaplain to look after their souls. And s six wanted a Roman Catholic priest and 15 wanted a Lutheran pastor. And they searched for a Lutheran pastor and found an American army chaplain called Gericke of German extraction who could speak German but was American. And they asked him to go and look after the souls of 15 Nazi war criminals. He said, never. They killed my two boys. But God had other plans. He said, you go. And here he is on his first Sunday morning facing Hermann Goering, the fat head of the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and von Ribbentrop and uh, Saukel and uh, Keitel and Ryder. And he wondered what to say to them. So he told them Jesus died for them. <laughs> Saukel was the first to fall on the floor and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Von Ribbentrop was the second. He began to read his Bible. And Padre Gerica found him on the floor of his cell begging for mercy from God. One after another. The two who refused were Rudolf Hess and Hermann Goering. They both committed suicide. In fact, Hermann Goering, when his wife and little girl came to say goodbye to him for the last time, little girl looked up and said, Daddy, please believe in Jesus. I want to see you in heaven. He pushed her out of the cell. He said, you can believe in your way and I'll believe in mine. And an hour later, he managed to take cyanide. And the Padre found him writhing on the floor of his cell. So von Ribbentrop was the first to mount the gallows, minister of propaganda. And as he came up to the hangman's noose, his last words were, I put all my trust in the redeeming blood of Jesus. I told this story in the church at Guildford and an architect, but not mention his name, but you will know him, came to me after the service, tears streaming down his cheeks, and he said, uh, I was a British Tommy in Germany at that time. And he said, some of us Christian British soldiers had all night prayer for those men. And we never knew if God heard the prayer. He said, now I know. I was speaking in Newbury in a house to about a dozen people, Newbury on the Thames. And uh, when I told this story, a young couple went hysterical. And uh, she was laughing and crying at the same time. And I said, uh, shall we stop and come and pray with you? No, carry on. I said, "Would my, my wife will take you through into the bedroom and talk to you and pray with you. No, she said, go on. And afterwards I went to them and said, what, what upset you so much? And she said, I am Keitel's niece. And everywhere we go, when people find out I'm Kyle's niece, nobody wants anything to do with me. We went to Canada, they found out. We went to Australia, they found out. We come to Newbury and they found out. But she said, tonight you tell me Uncle Kyle is in heaven. <laughs> she said, a cloud has rolled away. And she said, now if people say to me, Kyle was your uncle, I'll say, yes, he was. And he's in heaven with Jesus. Will you be? <laughs> That's what I'll say to them, she said. I wonder how you feel about this. You see, the Nazis were human beings, fallen sinners like you, and able to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. There's hope for us then. We're all sinners, we've all fallen. The Holocaust reveals the depths in human nature. 
given sufficient pressure, we are all capable. And it's not for us to say you were a brutal beast. You were a human being like me. And you were tempted to be cruel to others. And you fell. That's why the guilt of Jew or Gentile cannot be absolved by us. We can't forgive each other these things. God alone can forgive, for these were sins against heaven. And in his sight, I must draw to a close. The Holocaust confirms the biblical view of God. Not just the biblical view of man is vindicated, but the biblical view of God. It is not whether you believe in God that matters, it's what kind of God you believe in. Two-thirds of the British people still say they believe in God, and it doesn't matter that much to them. Why not? Because they don't believe in the right kind of God. It's not whether you believe in God. It's what kind of God we believe in. When I was a chaplain in the Royal Air Force, I had to be the chaplain to atheists. That's because there were three chaplains, RC, C of E, and OD. Roman Catholic, Church of England, odd bods, other denomination. <laughs> And when a bunch of new men arrived at camp, the C of E always demanded first pick, and he took off everybody christened C of E. Then the RC took all the Irish speaking away, <laughs> and I was left with everything else. Baptist, Methodist, Salvation Army, Brethren, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, agnostic, atheist. You could register as atheist and I was their chaplain, and when a man arrived with this card and it said, religion, atheist, I said, now sit down. I said, I have three things to tell you. Number one, you have more faith than I have. To believe that all this came out of nothing into what it is now, all by itself with no help, I just don't have enough faith. <laughs> and I said, secondly, if you are killed while you're under my care, and we were losing half our pilots every six months, I said, I will have to bury you. I will make you a solemn promise, I will not mention God, I will not open the Bible, I will not say a prayer, I will not sing a hymn. I'll simply announce this man is dead and gone. And I found out that there are many happy to live as atheists, but they're not so happy to die as one. <laughs> now, that's a little bit of a risk. And then I used to say, now tell me what kind of God you don't believe in. <laughs> and when he'd finished, I could always say, that makes me an atheist too, because I don't believe in that kind of God either. Now listen, my greatest burden right now that I'm sharing as often as I can is this. A sentimental view of God is replacing the scriptural view of God. A God who is supposed to be love, only love and all love has replaced the God of the Bible. Broadcast religion is the worst offender. And that is partly because when you're on radio or television, you have one disadvantage that I don't have tonight or in church when I speak, and that is you can't switch me off. But you can switch a radio or TV off if you don't like it. And so there has come about a comforting gospel that presents God as all love, a user-friendly God who wouldn't hurt a fly. And the result is people don't fear God anymore even inside the church. And if people inside the church don't have the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, how can we ever expect people out there? And so I'm speaking as often as I can now on why would anybody be afraid of God? Because until we recover the fear of the Lord, we cannot arrest the tide that is flowing downhill, both inside the church and outside. Even hell has now been dismissed by evangelicals and charismatic preachers. They don't believe in hell anymore. That's why they don't preach it. They believe in annihilation. That means sinners just go into oblivion. Who's afraid of that? If I've lived a life of sin, vice, and crime, and somebody tells me you're going to go to sleep and never wake up, hallelujah, I've got away with it. Where's the fear of that? It was Jesus who said to his own disciples, don't fear the people who can kill your body and do nothing worse. 
rather fear him who can throw body and soul into hell. But if you don't believe in hell, what is there to fear God about? And so a sentimental view of God is taking over. Now the Holocaust kills that one dead. If you believe what I've been telling you tonight. And the scriptural view of God, which I put into a startling statement, which, which I believe is true, but which sends a shockwave through a congregation when I say it, the God I know loves righteousness more than people. The God I know loves righteousness more than people. One event in history alone would prove that. What I mean by that statement is that when God has to choose between preserving righteousness and protecting people, he chooses righteousness. And the event in history which alone would prove that is Noah's Ark, Noah's Flood, when he drowned the entire population of the world except for one family who were righteous in his sight. And the end of history is going to be like Noah's Flood, said Jesus. Same situation. Because there is law as well as love in God, there are sanctions with God. He rewards obedience and he punishes disobedience. He is a God who blesses and curses. And there is no difference in this regard between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. Won't mention his name, but the most popular author of today, I'm hearing about him everywhere I go in Christian circles, teaches that Jesus came to bring us the mother love of God as against the father love of God in the Old Testament. I believe that is heresy. Yet I've been asked to write commendations of that author's books and I cannot do it. We are hearing a phrase, the unconditional love of God. It's not a phrase in the Bible, but I'm hearing preachers use it everywhere. I know where it comes from. It's not from the Bible. But what does it mean? There are two men living in Essex, Danbury, Essex, who live together in a homosexual relationship. They have imported twins from Florida from a surrogate mother, <coughs> had difficulty getting them legally into the country, but they are now seeking to import triplets to join the family. They took the twins to be christened at the local parish church, and when the vicar showed a little hesitation, the two men said this, but God's love is unconditional. It is non-judgmental. And that's how it's being understood. That is not the God of Israel, nor is it the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, of course, are under a new covenant with God. Let's make it quite clear. I'm not under the Mosaic Covenant, the Covenant of Sinai. I'm under the new covenant that Jesus shed his blood to make with us. But that covenant, too, has sanctions. The differences are, first, that it is individual rather than collective. It's not made with the church. It's made with individual believers. It's made with whosoever believes. It is an individual covenant, and each person will pay for their own sins and nobody else's. That's the new covenant. Secondly, the punishment in the new covenant is not the same. It is not in this world. It is in the next world. And it is not temporary. It is permanent. The sanctions are worse under the new covenant. Judgment is more serious now, especially since Jesus is going to be the judge. And he understands us perfectly, can see right through us. I'm speaking about hell. And when I stood in the cremation chamber at Auschwitz, I thought this is the nearest thing to hell I've ever been. But it wasn't. There is nothing that we experience yet that is as bad as that. To be permanently shut off from God forever. And therefore, from all goodness, and to spend eternity with selfish, utterly heartless people, and with the devil and all his angels, it is horrific. 
When I wrote a book on hell, I was interviewed on radio and they tried to get me on television with um, Melvin Bragg, uh, but I wasn't free, unfortunately. But apparently I was that rare bird who still believed in hell. And they always began with the same question. It got boring. Mr. Pawson, how can a God of love send anybody to hell? And I answered with a question. I learned that from Jesus. And I said, whatever gave you the idea that God was a God of love? And the poor interviewer would stammer and stutter and say, well, <laughs> well, don't you Christians believe that? And didn't Jesus say that? I said, well, as a matter of fact, he did. But also everything I've ever learned about hell I got from Jesus. Nobody else in the Bible talks about it, only Jesus. I said, now what are you going to do about that? Are you going to say that he was telling the truth when he said God was love and telling a lie when he said God would send body and soul to hell? Is that pick and mix? And for some reason they would cut the interview quite short, but <laughs> nevertheless, the God that Jesus brought to us was a God who would send people to hell a God to be feared as well as loved. That's the balance I believe the Holocaust will bring. In the mercy and love of God, he's brought the Jews back to their own land. But a few years earlier, he showed his justice and why he had to deal with a people who had ceased to be of any real use to him. That's the message I've been giving you tonight. And I close in this way. God is not a God to be played games with. God to be taken seriously. And the Holocaust in my lifetime is proof to me that we need to take God seriously. Worship him with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That's a quote from Deuteronomy, but it's also in the New Testament. For God has not changed. He's the same God. He's a God who loves righteous. None of the interviewers ever asked me, how can a righteous God send anybody to hell? It would never have occurred to them to do that because all they've heard about is this love, love, love thing. You, mark my words, go through the New Testament carefully. They did not <laughs> preach the love of God to unbelievers in the New Testament. They preached his righteousness and the need for repentance. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. For in it is revealed the righteousness of God. And that is hope for anybody in the world and the hope for the world itself that God is righteous. He is good. He is moral. He will do what is right, what is fair. He is righteous. The only person in the entire universe who really is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May his name be praised. And here's my very last word. What can Christians learn from the Holocaust? Not to be caught up in assimilation and tradition. And if there are two things that are wrecking the witness of the church in this land, it's assimilation and tradition. And we just do not realize how much this is happening so that often the only difference between Christians and their neighbors is that they go to church on Sunday. The church is assimilating to culture. Take just one example. Remarriage after divorce is now as common in churches outside and among leading Christian ministers as if Jesus had never said anything. Actually, Jesus never said anything specific about abortion or homosexuality, but he said an awful lot about remarriage after divorce. But anybody who raises that subject in church will get a flood of protest, I know. And many preachers are afraid to mention what Jesus said about that from the pulpit for fear of upsetting congregations and losing members. We are assimilating. What is happening is that the church is following the world downhill, but 15 years later. We are seen to drag our feet, but gradually to accept the things that 40 years ago would have horrified Christians. 
It's happening in the church. And gradually, instead of, as Jesus did, he never lowered his standards to meet people. He always lifted people to meet his standards. That's what the gospel does. And the church will lose all credibility and indeed is losing respect because it's lowering its standards to meet the people. When the discussion of the ordination of women reached its climax, the Archbishop of Canterbury gave his decisive speech and he said, we must accept it because the church must be credible to contemporary society. I thought we were to be acceptable to the head of the church, not to make ourselves credible to the people. We should be leading the world uphill and showing the better way Especially if we claim to have replaced Israel, we better be a light to the Gentiles, fulfill their destiny, and lift the world to a holy, happy, healthy society. But instead, we are dragging our heels and slowly following the culture around us. Assimilation. And as for tradition, traditional practices and beliefs of the Christian church have become sacred cows that we don't want touched. I'll give you an example. Christmas. Jesus never told us to remember his birth, only his death. He never told us to celebrate Christmas. We've made it one of the biggest things and we've incorporated all the pagan traditions of carol singing and yule logs and Christmas trees and fairy lights and all the tinsel of it. And Christmas makes Jesus sick. But when I say that, the protests that come from church people is incredible. But it's a tradition, nothing more. Let me mention two more. The division of Christ's body into clerical and laity, into professional and amateur, is totally against New Testament teaching and was never the will of Christ for his people, but we've accepted it. It's been going on for centuries, and we accept it as if it's Christianity. And I'm going to dare to mention a third, christening. There is certainly ground for infant baptism in tradition. It's been going on for at least 1,600 years. But there's precious little ground for it in your New Testament. But we accept it. It's part of the church's tradition. Need I go on? I could keep you for another hour <laughs> going through the traditions which have come to be regarded as essential to Christianity and are smothering the gospel of the New Testament. Even Easter, we're never told to celebrate Easter. The word Easter is the name of a pagan goddess of spring. But these are what people consider to be Christian. If they go to Communion on Christmas Eve, they think they've done their duty to the Lord of Heaven. And we don't fear God for it. Judgment begins with the household of God, says my New Testament. And I tremble to think what the Lord could do to a church that assimilates and smothers his word with tradition. If the Holocaust was what he did to his old people, it only lasted a few years and it only took a third of, th of them. The Bible, Old and New Testament says the people who know more are judged by higher standards. Those who have greater privileges have greater responsibilities. Are we learning the lessons from the Holocaust? I don't think so. We sympathize with the Jewish people for it all. But have we learned its lessons? Have the Jews learned their lessons? Have Christians learned them? I think not. And I just pray that God will use this video to help many to think again. I finish with these words from the New Testament. The Jewish branches of the olive tree were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. 
For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And that's the word of God, written to believers in Christ, and summarizes what we've tried to say tonight. I wondered how we should end tonight, and I suddenly felt we should have a two-minute silence for the Holocaust victims. That would seem appropriate on this Holocaust day. And as we are silent before our Lord, may something of the fear of the Lord touch us too. For it's the same God who is our God. Let's be silent for two minutes. Holy and Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, and the God and Father of Yeshua HaMashiach, we have just one prayer. In your wrath, remember mercy. Thank you for your patience with your people, both Jewish and Christian. Thank you that you give more than adequate warning, and that you've done everything you can do without forcing us to be saved from the wrath to come. And Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for all that you did to turn that wrath away from us, and how you experienced for the one and only time separation from your Father and how you experience the thirst and the darkness and the loneliness of hell so that we should never have to go there. Lord, we worship you. You are the Lord of history. We see in these events your hand, and we look for and long for the day when your Son will come back and take over the government of this sin sinful, sad, and sordid world. Thank you that we have a hope. But Lord, we cry to you for your church in this country, that we make the same mistakes in your holy sight. Lord, grant that we may be what you want us to be, the salt of the earth and the light of the world, to bring Jew and Gentile to faith in Jesus the light of the world. 
So Lord, grant us not quickly to forget what we've heard this night. If I said anything that was not the truth and not from you, will you please blot it out from our memories before it does damage? But if this has been speaking the truth from you, I pray that your Holy Spirit will confirm it in our hearts. And not only confirm it, but enable us to act upon it. For your name's sake. Amen.